It's um, so yeah, it's a uh, just ginger beer. So it's like ginger ale. Nice. I, I thought it was. So there's a, there's a yeah. So there's a yeah. I know. I, I I get in trouble for that all the time. I I'll be on hangout meetings. I'll be drinking with this, and people are like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> so it's ginger. It's not. The it's, like, it's like one o'clock. It's like yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's seven a.m. Man. It's like yeah, no, that's happened before. I'll be like, it's like it's like eight in the morning. You're drinking. It's like well, don't judge my lifestyle. But. <laughs> <laughs> you live dangerously. Right. But um, there's a little Korean deli across the street here. There's not a whole lot of places to eat where we where I am working right now. Mm-hmm. It's not like the last place where we were just flush in places. So there's a Korean deli across the street that does you know they do um, uh, you know sandwiches and stuff and you know French fries, which you know that's fine. Um, but they also do a couple Korean dishes as well. So they do bibimbap and they do bulgogi. Uh, they do beef bulgogi and pork bulgogi, and they do a few other, few other things if you ask them. That's cool. Um, but they also have it's funny they, the the chef who's there, or not chef the cook who's there now, also it, she's from um, Honduras, so they started bringing in, um, she started just making stuff, you know. So I, I get like osmil de avena, and um, and the, the crazy thing about this is that this little deli before I started working here was it was under a different management, and it was the crappiest place ever. It was so bad, and so like one day, like they just they, they, you know they switched hands, and this uh, the Korean woman bought it, and then she brought on the um, the hundred and cook, and uh, all of a sudden the reason I'm telling this story is like all of a sudden this showed up, and I was like oh man when I was a kid, you know we used to drink this um, you know we used to drink you know, ginger beer like this this type, so and I and I don't see it. And this is the extra ginger extra ginger as opposed to the weaker ginger you might find in other drinks. So it, it's. It's somewhat nostalgic, but anyway, the, the whole point is it. that I go over there and I get, you know, either osmil de avena uh, in the morning or bulgogi or whatever, but uh, either way, since I go over there at different times of the day, I'll come back with something like this and people will be like, what are you doing? You're, you're drinking well, on the job. Right. I woke up with a pint of Guinness at 6 a.m. So that's... Right, exactly, because that's why, that's why I keep going, like I said. <laughs> well, I, you know, I've, I've never had that. It must be quite an experience. Speaking of experience... Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. I I was thinking you you're uh, quite an expert now on on XPI XAPI right. Yeah. So that that's why I, I was wondering maybe we should have a little chat about it and sure. you're going to be presenting at the DevLearn right about this. Right. So I'll be talking at Dev. So I'll be doing two things at DevLearn. I'll be um. Uh, first I'll be helping with the uh, XAPI hyperdrive. So I'll be one of the judges, and I'll be helping you set up. So that is a competition, competition uh, between different um, people or organizations or whatever who want to present an implementation of the Experience API, and um, and we'll be, uh, you know, we'll hopefully get a couple um, you know, contestants, so to speak. Hey, Mark. Okay. We'll get a couple contestants, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll uh, decide who of that group of contestants is. Uh, is most worthy, and then those three will be used as examples of how to, you know, how to how to kind of work with the Experience API in a way that's not, um, you know, um, rote. You know, it's something that's new and something that really highlights the uh, possibilities of the specification. So, and then uh, I, I'll be probably be speaking after that uh, at, at a different event to talk about. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll also be talking about um, a research paper that um, some colleagues of mine here at ADL. And a guy named Steve Foreman and myself uh, wrote on the Experience API. So we wrote that for the eLearning Guild, and I think it got released la- while I was in Asia. I think it was released when I when I was in Tokyo. Um, so that's out there. So we're gonna we're gonna be there to answer questions uh, and talk about the spec. Hopefully, people will have a lot of you know strong questions for us. Um, I know that when I started talking about the Experience API with people, I didn't get the answers that I wanted. You know. And that I think it's really important for people just to talk to a person um, about their problems and and, their, and what they understand about it and what they don't. So yeah, I, I think a lot of times when we were when we hear about new technology, everybody just talks about how wonderful it is and in right. theory it's amazing. But we, yes. it's nice to see real things being done with that technology, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm culprit of that in the past, talking about you know augmented reality in education and all that, all kinds of possibilities and. Right. And then we explore, a, a, you know, a little bit to an extent, and then fall back into other things. And you know, 
Well, so it's nice to yeah. see what people are doing in the field with that kind of stuff. Right. So I, I think I think that's absolutely right. And I think we're all guilty to some degree yeah. <clears throat> of you know being very, especially people like ourselves who are you know sort of on the we're at the position in our in our work where we understand what we're doing and we understand what's possible and we really want to bring a lot of more of that what's possible into the workplace uh, or into our, our environments and you know sometimes we forget that and this is I think is a problem and not to comment on learning and development as a whole as an industry but I think we don't always consider um, you know the, the basically the the rest of the organization and, and and we don't always have the best sense of business acumen so we're working to solve smaller problems I'd say uh, sometimes and and you know or we see how we can solve some other issues, but we're not looking at, you know, infrastructure, um, you know, investments made by the organization, um, ability for people to actually get IT to bend to its will, which is no small task. Uh, so yes, it, it, in all those things, augmented reality, um, even you know, even like something as simple as flipping a classroom, you know, you really have to kind of get some momentum and, and some buy-in, and you have to more importantly understand how what you're doing is going to positively affect in, in a real way uh, what's happening in your organization. We don't always we don't always have that when we when we're kind of happy with a, a specification or some sort of new technology. We're just like, I think this will help. I want to try it out. And it's kind of hard to get the momentum to do that. So Yeah, it's always nice to, to have a plan when you want to do that kind of stuff. And it's, and to I think to have that plan you gotta understand exactly what what can be done, and, and that's that's when people like you doing this exploration work come, comes mm -hmm. into play. I, I wonder. So I, I guess we could start with the basics. So there's Tin Can API, Experience <coughs> API, right. X API. Uh, yeah. Let's define what it is and what it can do. How is it different from Scorm 1.2 or or? Right. You know. So um, Scorm. I don't have you asked question. So Scorm. Um, <laughs> is a, uh, what do you call it, <clears throat> SCORM is a specification, um, not actually a standard, but a specification that was created to solve a particular set of problems that were experienced by, um, well, everyone who was working in e-learning at the time, mm -hmm. uh, back in the dark ages of, of the last century, but um, in particular, um, the United States government and the military in particular. So we needed a way to, um, you know, sequence events, uh, learning events, we needed a way to uh, package uh, this in a way that would be universally understood. We need to be able to communicate, uh, take learning that was created uh, for one system and move it to a different system and not have to do crazy things to, to change it. So SCORM, not to get too technical and too into it right now, but SCORM fixed a lot of the problems that the United States military had uh, in that regard and therefore fixed those problems for you know, pretty much everybody else. It, it was the unifying standard. Um, but there's some things that SCORM doesn't do, and, and it's not really its fault. You know, I'm not going to down, down talk on SCORM. It's our baby, you know, speaking, speaking on behalf of ADL. But there's some things that it wasn't made for. It was made specifically, for example, it was made for web-based training. Now, that's, that was the case because that's what we had at the time. It will work for, you know, training that's not based on the web. But, uh, and again, not to get too technical, but it was created for, you know, web-based training that used frames, you know, so the, and, and stuff that would happen within the frame. You've probably run into this, you know, uh, uh, manifestations of this situation when you've been working with an LMS or, or trying to get things to kind of cram in there or you're trying to get different, you know, screens to pop up. Like, a lot of what SCORM is is what's sort of in the way or enabling what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is that SCORM was made to, you know, it says things like you uh, passed, you stopped, you terminated, you know, you started, terminated, you paused, you got a score, but that score has to be like a function of 100, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that kind of thing. Well, there's a, a bunch of other possibilities associated with learning events, and you, you know this, like, you know, um, there's any number of things that can be done. And so what started happening in the real world outside of e-learning is that um, people were finding ways to do things. They were, they were getting around the LMS. They were getting around other things. They were using platforms that were a lot more like Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. Or Twitter, where you had act, you had streams to my right here. I've got another entire screen where I've got Tweet Deck open, as I'm sure everyone does, um, and I've got like streams of information happening to my right, like you know things happening here, or like um, in uh, on Google Plus or in Facebook, where you have like oh this person posted something to their wall, this person um, 
did what it, you know uh, happened you know is now in a relationship and this person's you know the relationship status is it's complicated whatever um, that kind of that that basis that activity stream this person did something mm -hmm. uh, is the basis for what the experience API is it's reporting on learning activities um, in a very simple human readable manner <clears throat> but it's kind of under kind of supported by JSON. So mm -hmm. it's also machine readable. So it's 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 very simple that way. And, and from that simple structure, you know, X did Y, or you know, whatever that whatever that works out to be, you can get um, really complex variations and and really um, clever uh, ways to describe learning situations and, and to store information. Um, so some mm -hmm. of the things it was, uh, XAPI was created to do was to work on outside of web-based training, right? So you don't have to be at a desktop. Um, I think one of the primary catalysts for the call for an update to SCORM or whatever was going to come next is that people were trying to move to mobile. Well, SCORM's not really made to work with disconnected devices, right? And in the early days of mobile, and this is actually still the case right now, you'll have, um, what do you call them? You'll have learning experiences uh, that were designed to be on mobile devices, but the connection, the internet connection, wouldn't be persistent. SCORM was made to work for a persistent internet connection, and why wouldn't it be persistent, right? Mm -hmm. You're telling it when you're starting and when you're stopping. You know, there's, there's no really accounting for, like, losing power, I guess. Um, the Experience API is made to work for, any, you know, any kind of thing. It stores information. It doesn't have to transmit that information right away. So as an example, you could have a dumb device, like a, a mine, you know, gas uh, detecting device, you know, so detecting dangerous uh, levels of gas underground. And you could actually have, you could actually write uh, software that would actually record, that would actually produce experience API statements that describe what's happening with that device, and then store those statements until you got above ground and were able to, you know, safely transmit that information. Because all of these statements in the experience API are timestamped, um, it, you know, you'll have all that information in the context, in the order in which it, it, it actually happened. So, mm -hmm. so, so in, in, in short, the XAPI existed to pick up from a technological stand and, and technological and um, processual standpoint uh, mm -hmm. where SCORM left off. So, so, for example, we could have uh, say a, 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 it's just a classic. We're not, you know, not talking about location based or anything like that, but. A um, an employee is going through uh, is a manager going through uh, performance reviews of their employees. Uh, you know, so that manager starts doing things like giving a rating or writing comments back, feedback, and all that kind of stuff. That could potentially be captured by right. the XAPI as part of that leader's growth and, and and learning as it goes, even though it's not exactly a learning event in an right. LMS, right? And which brings us, I think it, it makes, uh, not to bring up a buzzword, but big data in, on learning that X, yeah. XAPI w is going to start recording a lot of what's happening outside of the classroom, even if that's a virtual yeah. classroom in a sense. Yeah, no, as, I, I think you're absolutely right. It, it also makes it more difficult for learning designers, I guess, uh, people like ourselves to you know, what we were designing in the past and the, the kind of schemes and the, the, the plans we had for our learners can can now be very complex. And the information we get from that mm -hmm. can be very complex. And the kind of experiments we do to see whether what we're doing is working can be complex or possible at all. Well, that's really great or extremely terrifying, depending on who you are. So, yeah, we'll see. Did you have some, uh, uh, do you know of some good examples already of things that people are thinking outside the box with using the XAPI? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I have seen some of the, I've seen some of the details for some submissions to the uh, XAPI hyperdrive, but I won't reveal those right now because hopefully it'll be a surprise okay. in about a month. Um, I think some really interesting, uh, I, I heard of a company, and, and I won't reveal the name right now, which is using uh, the Experience API not strictly to talk about what has happened, but to use it as um, uh, a way to do predictive modeling, you know, within a workplace. So not just, you know, what things have happened in regards to learning and training, but actually allowing instructors to model what might happen with this particular group of people, this type of, with this, uh, this cohort of students using uh, instructional methodology 
you can expect this kind of uh, result. That is, that's already like that's already blowing my mind, and I've already heard about this, and I've just said it again. It's really, it's it's the kind of thing that is again really great and really terrifying. There are people who are looking at uh, creating learner profiles uh, where you can actually track, you know, what people have been doing over time. You know, you can uh, uh, tailor um, training that people are, are being served um, according to certain specifications, mm -hmm. you know, of, of their learning. Not their learning style, but, for example, whether or not they speak English, whether or not they've learned to speak English in the past, you know. So, you, for example, if you have someone who started uh, working or started working in an organization and their English language skills weren't that great at the beginning, you know, it may serve them content in their native language. But you can have a little data from another learning system that says, well, this person's been, you know, participating in an English language study over a period of, like, you know, three or four years. Now their English language proficiency is much better. Mm -hmm. How do we know? We have this other, we have all this other data associated with their English language uh, learning progress and, and the ways that they've proven that they, they can, they, you know, what they comprehend. And look, their reading comprehension level is up to X, Y, and Z. So you know what? We're giving them training now, we're, and we're continuing to give them annual training at this point. We're going to give them the English language stuff because they've already proven that that's, you know, that they can actually handle that. And this isn't something that has to be monitored. Even. This could be something that happens automatically once you trigger certain levels of competency. So a lot of the things that are being, and I won't get in too much into it right now, but a lot of the things involving competency and personalization, um, some of those are really, really interesting. Another thing that, uh, that I think is, is quite somewhat out of the box is the potential um, confluence of augmented reality and the experience API. Mm -hmm. So this is stuff that's happening kind of in, um, it's very nascent at the moment. I think groups are, are kind of trying to feel each other out and figure out how this is going to work, but there is a, um, there's a potential for having augmented, um, well, having augmented reality uh, situations where you're able to uh, fine tune your, your psychomotor skills uh, based on um, actions within um, augmented reality instruction or, um, I guess, support. And then basically recording those actions and then basically giving uh, virtual feedback on the production or the, um, the execution. So that takes things like physical education and, um, and uh, marksmanship uh, or other martial training to a different level of, of uh, specificity and, and insight, I would say. And, but more importantly, at least to, to me, uh, a good way to look at how people progressed over time in, in a granular fashion. So there's also been a lot of work, you know, um, using Unity game engines and the Experience API. There's a company I, I, I talked with uh, recently who's been doing that. And um, I'm looking forward to more of that. As someone who plays Ingress, uh, which is an um, augmented reality game that, that I think you're probably familiar with. I, I think you're probably familiar with it because I tell everybody about it. But, um, <laughs> But, you know, like actually putting, um, creating games that actually take, um, you know, allow you your input, um, you know, in the matter of like QR codes or uh, ge uh, geolocation or using um, Bluetooth sensors and actually having all of that influence what you're doing, not only influence what you're doing uh, because of, of, of for, um, uh, the ability to contact or, or get information from that, those sensors, but also putting information back out there to those sensors to influence what's going to happen next. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of good, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of good case studies being created. What I love about the end of 2014 and what I'm looking at at 2015 is a lot of the stuff we've been talking about is starting to happen. So it's very exciting. Yeah, it seems like it's, it's laying the groundwork for, for that to happen, like the real location-based learning, right? Yeah. Based on, on, on where people are located, what they are doing, you know, the person just checked in to place X, uh, they needed, you know, like a UPS store. They they just checked in, into the UPS store. Maybe we need to prompt them to. Did you remember right. to bring your label? If not, blah blah blah. Go to the station. Like practical ways of doing it, right? I was yeah. I was at a um. I, well, I was at a. I was at an e-learning conference in Korea a few weeks ago, and one of the presenters, a Korean professor, his subject, hit the topic of his uh, talk was the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. Um, in Korea, and it was very inspiring. But you know, one of the questions I had at the end of it was like, "Well, how is how is this going to happen?" And I, I really feel like I mean, it doesn't have to be X API; that it can be APIs like X API. But I feel like the X API can be one of those ways in which some of the 
uh, automatic triggered um, affordances, you know, that are that, that are that are uh, made in the process of learning mm -hmm. and, uh, and performance support. Uh, I feel like the X API could be the the connective tissue, the glue that allows that to happen. It seems like also that the X API is more. It, it's an open type of well, it's an API, right? But it is an, an open type of access to what people are doing, to tasks people are doing. So opening up for better task-based learning based on real data that you collect as people are doing, not what they tell you that they're doing, but what really they are doing, right? And yes. So there, there's definitely. Um, well, it, it depends. You can do it either way. You can have self-reporting systems, like uh, through Tapestry. Uh, I think that's that's one of those uh, really popular apps that you know is about like you know do you're actually inputting that information, and you can have it such that you know um, you have an external authority saying that this person did that. So whether or not people said that, oh yeah, I, I totally have it, or you know I did that. No, I can see in your your transcript. Or, which aren't, which isn't especially different from what is happening now, you know, without XCPI. It's just we're making it easier and more um, automatic. Mm -hmm. It seems like places, uh, uh, applications like Tapestry, for example, they make it more uh, open um, to the learners seeing what they're doing and seeing what other learners are doing, right? Um, in general, uh, people that fit the same role, for example, can see that what other potential high potential learners are doing as well uh, with with SCORM and other types of you know uh, technology like that before uh, parameters we it was closed to the LMS to the system nobody saw actually what was happening mm -hmm. you only knew if you passed or not that was it pretty much right or continue from here from where you started but that's more of a transparent thing you see what you're doing you see what what others are doing if it's configured that way right right yeah. well I would definitely say that um well, open. So I, I can say, speaking from ADL standpoint, probably, um, you know, having these a commitment to. Well, I was going to say there are two things. Commitment to open source in general is something that you know is, is kind of strong here. But also, commitment to open data. Yeah, I, I think it doesn't. I'll, I'll start off by saying it doesn't have to be that way. I think there's a strong feeling among several people in the experience API community that, you know. Students and learners should like never really see this stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's not because they're not allowed to. It's just they don't have to. They don't have to complicate, you know, their lives with all this information. That information is really available to people who want to take advantage of it to improve things. So that would be the camp. <coughs> pardon me. That would be the camp of people who think that okay, this information is available to instructional designers and learning designers and other people who need to change, tweak things so that you know we're getting the optimal whatever, mm -hmm. right? Which is made or whatever. The, whatever the, the metric is. But I think, personally, Craig Wiggins thinks that um, it would be a great thing for people to have access to this information along the way. Now, there was a really interesting um, series on uh, NPR's Marketplace, that was a show that's on, uh, I think through Public Radio International, uh, about the quantified classroom. This, was, this went on a few weeks ago, I think. I need to catch up on the audio uh, recordings myself, but they were talking about you know how this generation of children, you know, the ones, the kids that are at the bus stops right now, are you know, going to be the first generation where they're getting very granular information about their learning experiences recorded. And the question is, like, you know, one of the questions posed is, like, should they have access to this data and be able to review it? And I say, yeah, absolutely. I know that Ben Betts, uh, uh, associated with Learning Locker, I think he got into this whole thing because he started providing detailed information about class courses that he was providing to his students, to them, and they loved it. Yeah. You know, they, they were really happy about, you know, the opportunity to see where things maybe fell off or, um, you know, being able to kind of like put two streams of information together to get some insight. Yeah, I, I think that outside of learning, you know, I think we're definitely heading into a, a, a time of um, Maybe like maybe not in the age of quantification, but you know we're really trying to look as hard as we can at the information that is afforded to us. So yeah, yeah, I I, I don't think there's any good reason to keep that from people. That, uh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And now, where are people normally recording all this information? What what are the the types of systems we have for recording all this? Well, um, so one of the the crucial pieces of the whole the entire experience API scheme is the learning record store. So the learning record store is where statements are kept. Um, 
you can look at um, you can you know, we we've talked about or people talked about learning records stores like Watershed from Rust C Software or uh, the Wax LRS from Saltbox or you know Learning Locker's um, open source LRS or even ADL has an LRS although ours is really for not really for production it's really for experimental purposes only. Um, that's where the data goes. It goes to the LRS, right? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the big questions that we get, I, I get a lot personally through Twitter and on Reddit is, okay, is the LRS replacing the LMS? And the answer to that is not really. Um, for most people, I would say for most organizations, for most people who have an LMS, you know, that's the center of your learning data experience. You know, your entire, uh, um, um, ecosystem, you know, it's kind of centered that because you're getting your reports from that. You're also a lot of times the learning management system is, you know, serving in other information. It's doing it's also serves as a grade book. And, you know, it does a lot. The LMSs do a lot of things, and I think that's, you know, a an achievement and maybe a drawback um, uh, from many, the many learning management system vendors that are out there. So. Um, so one of the, one of the things that, in my opinion, that makes it difficult to choose a good LMS is that you have to consider like a multitude of, of functions, not just you know, not just learning record storing. Mm -hmm. By contrast, an LRS really, at base, exists only as a um, something to receive um, learning record, learning man, or I'm sorry, um, uh, learning experience data. So uh, XAPI statements. That's what it receives. Most commercial or you know the LRSs that you've heard of, like Wax or or, or, or uh, Watershed, they um, they have a reporting layer on them so that they can give you you know data in a certain way that you can get certain reports, you can cross streams, and so you're getting that they have a reporting layer so you you can get information out of the LRS. Um, that's not really quite necessary, and in fact, an LRS could really be someone just kind of looking at statements and writing stuff down. Like literally, that could be an LRS, but that's really impractical. So that's really what you need to kind of get going with an XAPI. Um, I think that's one of the hurdles right now for a lot of people is they're trying to figure out how an LRS fits in with their LMS. And to be honest, that's something we at, at ADL were working on as well. We're currently working on a roadmap to kind of help people figure out, okay, well, I want to start using Experience API, but I, we have an LMS and we're not, that's not going anywhere. What do I do? So we're, we're trying to figure out how to give people guidance on that and help them make good decisions about what to do with their learning ecosystems and what to do with their, their data. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that will be a, a big decision point as, as X API starts getting more adopted, right, is, is where is all that being stored, what are the interfaces you need and all that. It might be yeah, a little complex. Absolutely. All right. Hmm. It does bring up another issue, of course, um, of how do you, um, well, it brings up several issues. One that, that I don't think is brought up enough is the issue of privacy. Um, I was just discussing this with a colleague thing, um, before we, we settled down to talk, but, you know, we are doing so much work in figuring out how to connect information so we can 